artists, non-artists, I'm so happy that you can join me for today. So I am not in Africa yet. I thought I would be by now, but I'm not. I'm still here. Uh, my passport didn't arrive on time. And with COVID, things are always a little bit iffy with traveling right now. So instead, I decided to film a video of me drawing my surroundings and actually more specifically drawing and painting dinosaurs. So I'm in a place called Drumheller. It's one of Canada's like I don't know, hidden secrets or maybe not so hidden. I don't really know how popular it is. But it's this place in, uh, in Alberta that has a ton of dinosaur bones. It's so cool. So my dad even discovered a dinosaur. Uh, yes, I will show you some video footage of that a little bit later. He also let me borrow some drone footage. So you get to have a little extra treat in this video. I did not buy a drone. I want to one day though. So uh, yes, I'm looking forward to that, especially like in Africa, I think that the uh, landscape is going to be super different than here. So I did some sketching um, in front of a giant, awesome uh, T-Rex. Well, it wasn't a T-Rex. It was an Albertosaurus, I think. So I did that sketch in the museum. And then another uh, very interesting project. Um, we have all of these like statues of dinosaurs all scattered throughout the town. So maybe like 30 of them. And I, so I just drove by some and they were painted white. And I was like, hang on a second, maybe they are getting ready to be painted. And I looked into it a little bit further and it's just people who volunteer to paint them. So yes, I will show you some video footage of that too. I did get this video out a little bit late, but I usually do like the 15th or so halfway through the month, but I got accepted to do this dinosaur project. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm just gonna do a really long video and I'm gonna add that footage in too. So a little bit late, I'll hopefully be on time next month. And I hope that you enjoy watching, thanks. So my dad went for a walk and he was looking for dinosaurs, I think. I think this, was, this has been like on his bucket list to find one, to discover one. And so he found all these cool things, a cave, and um, just he started to see all these little crumbly bits of bone uh, petrified bone and he was like I think this is all coming from somewhere so he's very smart and he followed the trail that led up to this point where this like huge discovery is and it's so cool because he took a little piece and he took it to the museum and they said that it is a um, pachyrhinosaurus that's what it is it's a pachyrhinosaurus probably the biggest find of 2020 and um, it's pretty exciting. It's, yeah, we're all very like, what? This is just craziness. Yes, so here I am sketching in the museum. It's called the Royal Terrell Museum, and it's just beautiful. Like, as you can see, um, that dinosaur in the back, just the way that they display it and the lighting on it, uh, it's, it's just gorgeous. So anywhere you look in the museum, it's a good place to, to sit down and do some drawing. Now, unfortunately, they didn't let me take my tripod in, so it was a little bit difficult. I had to put my camera up on like a ledge and try to prop it so that I could, you could see what I'm doing. And so that was a bit tricky. Um, but again, it's just trying to go with it, trying to um, just do what you can with the, with the material you have and with the options you have and to just be flexible. So I start out with, um, with using my pencil and just doing a pencil drawing first and then I'm gonna add watercolor. I had to work that day and I got to the museum with only like three hours to do something or it might have even been less time. And so I, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to, but it was still just a good experience to just 
sit and, um, and look at that just gorgeous um, dinosaur in the back and try to do something slightly dramatic. So here I'm, do I'm painting with watercolor. Um, I have this little travel kit that I take with me and uh, it came with like these hard little pucks basically of, of watercolor. And I think it's, yeah, it's Windsor and Newton. And they're, they're beautiful watercolors paints, but once those run out, you can actually just buy tube paint um, and squeeze it into those little um, sections and just let it dry. And it does the same thing, if not sometimes better. So it was a little bit um, weird here because I think it was pretty muggy out or something and uh, in that museum and my paint wasn't drying, drying very fast. So as you can see, like when I'm turning the page, you can still see that it's kind of shiny which is, you know, you just, uh, it's difficult, but you have to just work with it. So I would just lay the paint down and then just let it dry, let it do its own thing. And watercolor is kind of fun because it can have those like cool edges or uh, if you use a lot of water and then just let it, leave it and let it dry, then it can make this really neat texture. So I do enjoy working with watercolor, but I find it's one of the most difficult mediums because it's not very forgiving. You can't go back over top of it with white because um, if you go over with white, then that's actually not watercolor anymore. It's, it's gouache or it's mixed media. And I haven't used gouache very much. I would, I would be interested in trying it though. Uh, it's basically like watercolor, but it's opaque. So you can, um, yeah, just layer it in a different sort of way. But here with the watercolors, the, the white, if you want white in your painting, it's gotta be the page, like the, the paper underneath. So it does take a bit more planning, um, which is one reason why I just started with a drawing instead of going right into the painting because I couldn't erase, you know? Yeah, so just trying to think about where the darker places are. Another thing with watercolor, uh, you usually start light and then you work your way to the darks because you can't go lighter once you go dark. So um, as you can see, like even in my dark places, it's still pretty pretty light. I just kind of touched it. And then I'll go over it in a little bit with some darker color as well. And yes, I do use my fingers a lot <laughs> in painting. I just think it's another tool. You might as well use it. And this fly is going to join me. So I found that with painting dinosaurs or probably any skeletons, it's just a lot of ribs and vertebrae. <laughs> like, especially for dinosaurs, they've got those long tails and it's just the same, same, same just getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. I got to go and do a bunch of dinosaur drawings um, with my friend as well before this trip. And uh, we just sat in front of a dinosaur and just, it was called a gorgosaurus <laughs> or a gorgosaurus maybe, but we were like, oh, it's so gorgeous. And so that was fun. See, look at that beautiful guy. Look at his, his head and he's just so dramatic. I love it. The way that they have him set up as well, um, you can see, the rock behind him. Um, I think I didn't actually go and read the whole thing, but I think that um, they d didn't want to ruin him by taking him out. They just uncovered enough so that you could see him really clearly uh, or her. I don't actually know if it's a male or a female, but they didn't have rock around his head. They just have the black background, like the um, wall behind him or the ceiling, the roof. And so that brings out the contrast a lot more. And I think that it would be really a neat thing to be able to plan out a museum display because you'd have to think about all those things. You're like, okay, where's the most contrast? Where do you want the, the viewer to look? Like if you're dealing with real things that you just want people to, to learn from, but you, it's also an art form, I think. Um, so yeah, thinking about contrast, if you have a really dark background and a really light subject, then that's, that brings it out, um, or vice versa, if you have a very dark subject and a very light um, background. Yeah, it just makes you look there. So, um, and I think that like with this kind of shape too, you're just, it, everything just draws you to the head. Like the head is the important part. It's, it's like the highest point almost. And the tail just brings you over to the head the, and even the legs, like you just, you gotta look there. And it helps that he has very big, dramatic teeth. <laughs> like, they're huge. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my sister and I would joke that uh, it would be, you know, sweet if 
a T-Rex actually had lips, like a dog, you know? How dogs have scary teeth, and if you, if you pull up their lips, they look quite intimidating. But what if dinosaurs had just like big lips and big tongues, and they just looked like big dogs? <laughs> I don't think that was the case because, you know, they're kind of reptile-y, but, but that would be pretty cute. So it can be difficult when you're standing and you're holding a sketchbook, and I've seen like little palettes that can attach to your sketchbook or attach to your hand or your finger or something. And th that would be pretty neat because I had to like bend down every time I wanted to grab my paint or it was up on the ledge. So sometimes I situate myself where I'm sitting on the ground and then have the sketchbook on the ground. Or if there's like a little shelf, then it's sitting there. For this one, just because of the camera, I wanted it to be able to pick up what I was actually doing. So I didn't rest it on anything, it was just my hand, which of course gets exhausting after a little while. Like even a sketchbook that's not very heavy can feel very heavy after an hour, two hours of just holding it. <laughs> but if I did not have my camera, I would be putting that sketchbook on the ledge behind me, I'm pretty sure. And I'd be standing behind the ledge and you can still see everything, but um, just so that you can give your hand a break and it's not, you know, it has to be in the same position pretty much the whole time. If I was ambidextrous, that would be a different matter, <laughs> but I am not, unfortunately. So there's definitely great benefit to sitting in front of a subject and drawing it. Um, you're, you kind of see things in a different sort of way. You have to make it two-dimensional, but still make it look 3D, and you're looking at a 3D object. So that's a kind of a different experience. And I love that when you're copying something, just looking at it, you can go up to the subject and you can look at the different textures and you can um, see it from a different angle and you can pick which angle is your favorite. And I just, I love that part of it. I do think it's a bit harder because you're, you're uh, having to translate it into a two dimensional piece, but I think that that's super beneficial. One frustrating thing I noticed is that my dinosaur looked very small <laughs> and he just looked like he was, you know, maybe like a foot tall or something, <laughs> but that's just because it's on a small, um, a small piece of paper. And um, if I didn't have anything to compare it with, like if I was going to stand there for longer and do a lot more detail and stuff, I would probably add like the uh, rock behind it and the maybe some people like in front so that you could get a good idea of how big this guy is. And I have seen sketches that people have done of, of museums and they usually do that. They have like people looking at the exhibits just to give you some perspective. So this, um, this sketchbook, I actually made it. Uh, I took a bunch of old watercolor papers, just like extra that were lying around and I YouTubed a video, and I, I talked about this in an earlier video that I posted, um, but I watched a video of how to make a sketchbook, and then I just copied it like as exactly as I could. And so I've learned how to, how to make them. And it's a really great way to use up any, like, any extra paper that you're not gonna use, or you've already like, cut part of it, and so it's not, uh, it's not a big piece of paper anymore. Um, and especially if you have like, good quality paper that's like that, you don't really want to just throw it out because watercolor paper, as you know, can be very expensive. And so it's nice to just cut it up and, and make a sketchbook out of it. All right, here we go. Here is the perspective of how big this guy is. Oh, look at that. It's just huge. His teeth are beautiful. And he's black too. Like, I think it's because of like the sediment and stuff around him when they dug him up. He was, oh, he's just 
gorgeous. I think it's called Black Beauty, actually. And dun dun dun, we're going into the sculpture dinosaur. An adorable triceratops. It's like completely opposite of the last one. Uh, small compared to the big, you know, Albertosaurus guy. But, and, and it's a herbivore, so that's different. But I did do some research before I uh, painted this, this guy. And actually they would have uh, come into confrontations with each other because they discovered a T-Rex that had um, some of the, like, the tusks of the triceratops, um, they had scarring from them. And vice versa, the, they found some triceratops corpses that had been uh, bitten with T-Rex teeth and healed. So they actually, you know, didn't die in that confrontation. Pretty great. And yes, I did chop off all of my hair. <laughs> That's another big difference between these two uh, drawings and paintings. Um, we did a fundraiser for my leaving for Africa. So that's quite the difference. It's been growing now for a few weeks. Now this was tricky because uh, as you can, you can probably see in the video, but there have been layers and layers and layers on this guy, like uh, layers and layers of paint. So they just took like some primer and just went over the last layer and there is like major texture on this guy. So it was difficult getting some nice straight lines or getting um, you know any kind of detail in there because it was very hard to actually even just put the paint on. So you know it took a bit longer because of that. Uh, later on I do a bunch of scales and so it took a long time to like go over top of those scales like three or four times so that it would actually cover all of the area that I wanted it to. And my idea here was I wanted to do a dinosaur that could have actually like had these kind of markings and tried to think about what it would have and why it would look like that and I wanted to make it kind of camouflage because I think they would have been camouflaged because they're herbivores and but also kind of flashy on the on the um, frills there like the crown that he has because apparently that probably would have been for mating purposes it would have been like oh look at me I'm such a pretty side triceratops and so I did add some color up there a bit later. And then I've got these like, uh, this armor on the jaw because I looked at some pictures of iguanas and they had that and I thought it looked really, really cool. So I listened to music and audiobooks and podcasts the whole time. I think that that helps a project to not only go by fast, but also to be more enjoyable. But it was very loud there. There was like a ton of traffic that went by. It was raid on the road. like a few feet away from uh, the highway. <laughs> so one of the keys to doing fine detail on a surface like this is using quite a bit of water because then it just easily goes into those cracks and stuff. But another tricky thing was to not use too much water because if I did, then it might ruin the integrity of the paint and it's outdoor paint and I didn't want, because it's outside, I didn't want rain to come down and snow and stuff and for all that paint to wash off. So it has to be thick enough to survive, but thin enough to go on properly. Now, another, th another way to make stuff look a little more realistic is to do some blending. And a lot of things in nature have like, if you even just look at anything, it has blending to it. Like the shadows and, and the highlights and stuff is always blended in. And so I wanted to add a bit of that. It's kind of like an airbrush thing, just just going over it with a rather dry brush and um, feathering it out. That's kind of the same effect that you would get with an airbrush. I actually got super, super sore after doing these because I was just sitting on my knees the whole time or on my, or squatting or whatever, and my legs just were killing me. They were so sore. So being an artist sometimes is very physically taxing. <laughs> it's like a workout. So I just looked up a lot of different animals to try to think of how this creature would have looked. I like doing realistic stuff. Like a lot of the dinosaurs around Drumheller are, are not as realistic. They have like polka dots on them or whatever, which is also really fun. 
but just for my own style and to do something I'm comfortable with, I decided to stick with something that was more realistic. So here I'm adding the scales and I was also looked at a crocodile skin and I had done a, a crocodile in my painting in my last one. And so I had already done all that research. I'm like, oh yes, I'll just, I'll just draw from that knowledge and uh, think about how that would have worked. So trying to make it look 3D by adding a highlight to the top of those, of those um, scales. Is it called a... Are they scales with crocodiles? I don't think so. They're just like the thick crocodile skin. Looks kind of like bark. And as you can see, I'm going over it like three different times as I go down because it's just so textured. So I was trying to also think of the contours of this creature, how it would have all these folds and just the way that it moves. And I, I was debating whether I should even think about that because it's already a sculpture, but I thought that it would really just add to the shape of it to be able to even just do that optical uh, texture. So again, contrast plays into this in a huge way because I've got the dark lines and then the lighter green underneath and it just helps to give that illusion that the dark is further away than the, than the light so that it does look like those each individual scale is um, is three-dimensional so it's definitely going to be in order to make that contour it's got to be big um, in the place that's like close to you that's bubbled out and then get smaller as as the uh, creature folds and a good trick for this is to just step back from it sometimes or to think of it in a simple way like think of it as a ball right and so if you're looking at a ball try to think about where the lines would be if you had lines drawn on the whole thing. So I did also add highlights and darker areas for the green like underneath so that it looks like there is highlight on the top and underneath it's all dark so that you can see just like the form of it. So when you're doing something a project you can think about different ways of even doing your brush strokes and and putting your paint in the water and in the paint you can do thicker areas or thinner areas, just whatever serves the best purpose for what you're doing. So I don't know if you get this, but I can remember like exactly what I was listening to when I look at a drawing or a painting after the fact. I'm like, okay, when I was working on that piece, I was listening to this certain podcast or I was listening to this soundtrack or whatever. And I think that there's just something about uh, painting and doing art that just solidifies stuff in your brain. So if you ever want to learn like how to um, how to do something or how to um, draw something or whatever. I think just practice with just doing it over and over again. And you can like, if you want to learn how to draw cats, you can go to the zoo and just like look at lions and start drawing them and it'll solidify in your brain. Yeah, so I think that when you work on a project, just whatever level you're at, just do your best. Like this, people are going to come and see it and that's great and maybe kids will like sit on it and stuff and so it's fun to to do my best so that people will see and will be like oh that's so cool 
but even if you're just doing something for one person or um, for yourself even, like dig into your knowledge and just do uh, do whatever it takes to do your best. Like um, if that means turning off the music or if it means just like drawing something 50 times so that you get it stuck in your head, it's always best to, to do your best work on any project. And there's a bit of a different mindset for a project that takes seven days and a project that takes seven months. If you're, if you're doing something that takes a long time, it's gonna get stuck in your head and you're gonna just mull over it, like think about it all the time. And with a project like this, however, if you have a lot of experience and you've practiced a lot, then it gets done fast and you can still do a good job on it. So I, I do like doing these small projects uh, in the middle of a big project. I'm working on that project, the painting of a ship with the people all like dancing and stuff inside. And it's definitely a different mindset. It's, it's a long-term mindset. And ooh, I even use that as an analogy for my move. I'm moving to Africa and I'm gonna be there for a long time, for five years, or could be more, who knows. And it's a different feel than if I was going for two weeks or a month. Right? It's a, it's a long-term thing and I'm moving there instead of a trip. And so I'm going to prepare for it differently and I'm gonna do the research differently and learn the language. And uh, it's the same thing with a project with art. It's if you're gonna do a big long project, you're gonna do a ton of research and a lot of preliminary sketches and drawings and stuff. I think if you're getting stuck in a big piece of art and you're just like, what should I do next? I don't even know. Um, it's good to just put it down for a little bit, get back to it for sure, but put it down for a little bit and work on a small thing. Even if it's just a sketch in your sketchbook, going to the museum, going to the zoo and drawing an animal. Uh, I think that that just refreshes your brain and your creativity. <laughs> you enjoyed watching I enjoy doing those projects getting me kind of out of my comfort zone don't I don't do a lot of sculptures so that was something very different and I hope that you learned some stuff I definitely learned a lot of things as well and I hope to see you pretty soon um, not quite a whole month but you know on the 15th or something of October and hopefully <laughs> hopefully I'll be in Africa by then I'll see you guys later have a great uh, few weeks and enjoy just like sitting around a little bit, going back to work, quarantining if you have to do that. Um, yeah, just have a great time, be productive, and I'll see you soon. Bye!